Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Dr. Kim Hecht, and I am the Medical Director of Inpatient Ambulatory Care Services at the Susan Samueli Integrative Health Institute. Thank you so much for joining us during our community lecture, Integrative Insider Live. Before we start, and I know everyone's used to all of these virtual events, I just wanted to quickly review um, some tips for the session. So we are recording the session, and in this webinar, the participants will remain on mute and hidden on the screen. If you do have any questions, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to send in questions as well as to communicate with the event host throughout the presentation. We will hold a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. At this point, if you can please clear all distractions, that would be wonderful. The Institute is very proud to provide this free community lecture. We have multiple clinics located throughout Orange County. Our main clinic is located in Costa Mesa off of Bristol Street. We also have integrative services at UCI Health Sites in Newport Beach near Fashion Island, Pacific Medical Plaza, the Pacific Breast and Oncology, well, that's at the Pacific Medical Plaza in Costa Mesa as well, your Belinda, and our newest location is in Laguna Hills. Now on to our main event. Tonight we have the pleasure of hearing how to energize the older adult brain from Dr. Susan Yaki. Dr. Yaki is a professor in education and cognitive science at the University of California, Irvine, where she directs the Working Memory and Plasticity Lab. She is also a fellow at the UCI Center for the Neurobiology of Learning and Memory. She received PhDs in cognitive psychology and neuroscience, as well as a habilitation degree in psychology from the University of Bern in Switzerland. And she conducted postdoctoral work at the University of Michigan. Her current work is funded by the NIH, NIA, NMIH, and the New Schools Venture Fund. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Yaki to our Integrative Insider Live. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Um, let me. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. So again, thank me so much for having me and thanks so much for the nice introduction, Dr. Hecht. And I'm, I'm very happy to talk to you all about my um, our ongoing research that we do in my working memory and plasticity lab. So we have a series of um, ongoing and broad research question, and I'll give you a little bit of an insight of what we do in the next uh, 20 minutes or 30 minutes or so. And in, in broad terms, we study how people learn. Um, and in, in we also ask, do, learn, do people learn differently? And if so, why do they learn differently? And what is the role of the environment, education, or intellectual engagement on learning and brain development? And what experiences and strategies can help people become better learners? And then lastly, how can we use all this knowledge to promote healthy aging and uh, to help individuals uh, reach their potential? And here is a little bit of a, a picture of my lab. We have a large team of undergraduates and grad students and postdocs who help me uh, reach our goals and, and address uh, these questions. So when we look at brain development and, and brain plasticity across the lifespan, we know that our cognition and our brain changes as we age. So from being a young child, being a young adult, uh, and, uh, and then towards middle age and older adult. And typically what we see as we age um, brain plasticity and our brain uh, cognitive functions decrease as we age, sadly so. So we see some of the uh, negative effects of aging. And here what I'm showing you is an illustration from Naftali Raz's group at Wayne State University who have tracked uh, participants um, it, 10 years apart and they, they took brain scans from various areas of the brain in particular the hippocampus, which is one of the key areas in the brain that's responsible for memory. And memory, one of these cognitive functions that we typically um, experience ourselves as being particularly affected by aging. And what you see there are um, trajectories. So each of these little lines are, are, uh, is one person that had been scanned two times apart, 10 years apart. 
And we can see a little bit of a decrease in, in many people across age. So suggesting that as we age, some of the functions of the hippocampus and the volume seems to be uh, decreasing. At the same time, uh, there's also some remaining adult brain plasticity so that the adult brain retains capacity for plasticity. And in particular, there's certain, um, certain experiences and certain acti uh, activities that um, seem to be uh, promoting some brain plasticity as we age. And here's an example from a Kirk Erickson's lab uh, showing that physical exercise is one of these functions that seems to promote healthy, a healthy hippocampus, a healthy brown valium, and even shows uh, increasing um, volume over time as a function of doing uh, cognitive exercise. So physical exercise is one of these activities that can alter brain stru structure and maintain brain plasticity as uh, we age. But not only physical exercise can help you um, age uh, successfully or promote a cognitive um, healthy aging, there's also cognitive exercises that can get the similar benefits. But let me um, track back for a little bit and um, ask you a question that you can ponder for yourself for a little bit. As you think about your own memory, as it um, changes across the lifespan, when you think back uh, a few years um, back or uh, when you were younger, if you think about your memory functions, do you think your memory is still very much the same, is, is functioning the same, or has it changed as we age, and if so, how? And what people typically tell me is that they have the, the subjective impression that their memory gets worse as we age. And this can be true, but at the same time, I want to show you that there's several aspects about memory that changes and that changes differentially as um, a result of aging. So first of all, memory is not just one thing. So memory is something that's really multifaceted. That's uh, several aspects uh, of memory. And these several dimensions, they also show different trajectory as we age. So when we look at short-term memory, for example, our ability to remember a phone number in our head. So someone tells us the phone number, we walk over to our uh, maybe notebook to write it down. So this ability to hold information uh, in our minds for a brief period of time is typically not affected by aging. But if we have to do some, if we get interrupted in between or we're trying to hold a conversation at the same time as remembering this phone book, this requires what we would call working memory. So doing something with your short-term memory, that's typically where we see some negative effects on aging. And then when we go over to more long-term memory functions, um, there are different aspects about uh, long-term memory as well. So one aspect of long-term memory is called implicit memory. So that includes skills and habits. So for example, uh, our ability to drive a car, to ride a bike, or to know a certain recipe. So skills and habits typically don't show any changes across age or not, no negative changes. And then other aspects on, of uh, what we call explicit memory, so um, uh, conscious parts of memory, semantic memory, so our ability to remember, for example, that Paris is the, the capital of France or certain autobiographical memory, so having uh, remember certain things from our childhood. So these aspects also don't change or are not negatively affected by, um, by aging. But there are certain aspects of episodic memory, especially recalling certain events. So events that, um, for example, if I have to recall, what did I eat um, a week from yesterday? So this typically is a function that um, gets more difficult as we age. And in particular, what we call prospective memory. So our ability to remember, oh, I have to think about getting milk on my way home. So this is what we call prospective memory. That's typically what people experience as something uh, that is becoming more difficult as we age. But overall, so the take home message here is memory is not just one thing. So it's really multifaceted and not all types of memory are negatively impacted by aging. And if we go beyond just the memory components, so not all cognitive dom domains are impacted by aging either. So our general knowledge function, vocabulary, these are showing improvements across our uh, entire lifespan. So this really builds up as we build experiences and as we interact with the world. But then when we uh, talk, think more about processing speed or working memory functions, as I was mentioning before, 
we see this very characteristic inverted U-shaped curve across the lifespan where we typically do best when we're in, the, in our early 20s. And then from there on, we see uh, often a downwards trajectory, unfortunately so. At the same time, there are large individual differences in how these trajectories in processing speed and working memory looks like. So these are just illustrations of um, made of uh, individuals, but it often looks like this too, where there are some people who show this inverted U-shaped curve. There are some other people who show a market uh, improvement in these cognitive functions uh, across the lifespan or, or very much maintained um, cognitive functions across these life uh, across the lifespan in these skills. And the question is where these individual differences are coming for and uh, and also what can we do to maintain healthy cognitive aging even in these domains that seem to be typically affected by aging. So on one hand, um, there is uh, on the left, there's biology, genetic variation that plays a role in how um, our cognitive functions um, uh, progress through our, our lifespan, but there are also what we call modifiable health factors. So our diet, our physical exercise that I was showing you before, or also sleep, uh, hygiene, and on the negative side, then substance uh, use, mental health, emotional state, they can all affect how well we, we, we age cognitively. And then what we are um, working on in my lab, we focus on the role of cognitive and intellectual engagement and whether that's how that might promote healthy aging, the role of education, uh, the role of culture, experience, and, and again, how that might affect cognitive aging and, and um, cognitive health. And also more recently, the role of attitude and motivation. So our own self-efficacy beliefs and attributions, they also have shown to uh, contribute to um, a healthy lifestyle and then ultimately to uh, cognitive uh, health. So what are some of these activities that have shown to be uh, beneficial for brain health? So my graduate student, Ali Weaver and I, we have surveyed a large number of uh, older adult participants. So older adult meeting 65 and up. And we, we polled them on different types of activities that they might be engaged in. Um, on a weekly basis. And this is just a, a small glimpse of various activities or the most common activities that this particular sample has reported. And there are a range of different, what we would call cognitive activities like playing games or read, playing, com um, playing computer games or in being engaged with the computer, work on the computer. But there's also social events like volunteering, going to church or going to concert movies, meet other people. And then a large, number of participants have also uh, reported various um, uh, uh, various aspects of physical exercise from just going on a walk, but also uh, on a leisurely walk, but also um, things like gardening or housework is also considered a physical exercise. And the, the nice or the important thing is that there's a, a positive relationship between how frequently are you engaging in these types of activities and your cognitive performance as we age. The effect is not very strong, but it's still reliably there. So showing that the more activities you do in your daily life, so these lifestyle type of activities, that's also something beneficial for your cognitive performance and for your cognitive brain health. And in particular, so it has been um, really uh, important to show that some of the, the cognitive domains that is really affected by these lifestyle experiences is working memory. And uh, you, you might remember that the title of my lab is Working Memory Plasticity Lab. So this is really the focus on um, in, in my lab. So we're trying to understand um, the, the role of working memory in our daily life. So working memory is at this intersection between everything that we see, that we hear, that we interact with. Um, all this information enters what we would call our working memory store, our working memory um, uh, process. And it, it holds this information in mind in order to do other things. For example, to, to hold a conversation, to do math problems, to, to, to solve problems. Um, so it's really this intersection between incoming inf information and information that I, you need to do, uh, to do things that, uh, in everyday life. So it's really essential for everyday functioning. Um, but uh, sadly enough, it's also one of the key cognitive domains that is impaired in many developmental and clinical disorders. And as I was showing you before, it also seemed to uh, it also um, seems to de decline with advanced age. Is one of these 
um, cognitive functions that is especially susceptible to the effects of aging. So this is why in my lab we develop uh, games to promote working memory skills in order to, um, to train people on these working memory uh, type games with the idea that if they can improve in their working memory skills, it might help them also in their daily life activities and everything that relies on a healthy um, working memory functioning, such as, again, problem solving, language skills, math, but also remembering, for example, um, that I have to take my medication at a certain period of time. And this is to illustrate that our games are really designed that they can work across the lifespan from little kids in the middle to older adults uh, and, and also young adults. And if you're interested, we have a couple of apps that are available on the App Store, but you can always um, participate in, in one of our ongoing studies if uh, after I show you some of the uh, effects of our studies that you're interested in and I'll provide some links later. So in general, so we, we designed these games in order to promote working memory, as I was saying. And when we look across um, a sample of older adults, so this is with my collaborator in, in Prague in the Czech Republic, in which he trained uh, uh, older adults either uh, during 20 sessions, so a four to five week uh, training intervention where they trained on their working memory uh, every day, or uh, people who trained only, only for 10 sessions. And you can see here, very nice trajectory. The longer people train, the better they became in solving these working memory problems in, in this uh, working memory training. So this is sort of somewhat interesting. So you would expect what you're training on, you're also getting better at it. So the more you train, the, more, the better you get at certain things. But the important part is we also see what we call generalizing effects or transfer effects in other domains and other tasks that were not directly part of the training. So what I'm showing you here is um, improvements in problem solving and visual spatial reasoning a task as a function of um, a training on, on working memory. So the, and, and what I'm showing you here is the longer you train on this working memory um, task, the more improvement you also show in these uh, visual spatial abilities and these problem solving uh, measures. And we see the same effects also in young adults. Also here, the more they train, the longer they train, the more improvements they show in these non-trained visual spatial reasoning uh, domains. And we see this not just in visual spatial reasoning, but we also see other domains that seem to be positively affected by these types of working memory activities. Um, non-trained uh, domains of working memory or long-term episodic memory skills or these visual spatial skills that I uh, sh showed you. And not only that, we also see brain changes as a function or as a result of um, cognitive training. What I'm showing you here is an illustration of brain networks on the left are for, for young adults and all the, on the right for older adults. So these are some of the key networks. And what we typically see as we age is that all, the, the older we get, the, the more, um, the more um, correlated and the more or the less um, segregated these different work uh, um, networks are, that makes it harder for the brain to process certain things. So this is then also correlated with poorer cognitive performance that we often see in older adults. But the nice part about this is too, that with cognitive training, with working memory training, these older adults' brains start to look a lot more like young adult brains too, suggesting that some of these um, uh, effects on, on, on working memory by training really affect very deep and, and, and profound structures that are visible in the brain as well. What about some of the other domains? So I was mentioning education and culture and experience. So one, one aspect, I'm at the School of Education and, and, and there's a lot of research out there suggesting that education um, acts as something that we would call like a cognitive reserve. So our collective experiences that we build up our lifetime seems to act as a cognitive pro uh, protection against the, the negative effects of aging. But there are also other experiences and, and um, uh, activities that have very similar effects. And here is a, just an illustration of my colleague, Rachel Wu at uh, UC Riverside, who engages with older adults who learn how to paint, who learn how to, to write, so they have not done that in their life before, and uh, demonstrating that engaging and learning in these new skills uh, also seem to promote cognitive aging. And our own uh, work uh, that is uh, also um, 
uh, supported by the Samueli Foundation is we look at the effects of music and also art on cognitive brain health. And if you're interested also to, to learn more or, or pot potentially engage in, I will provide some links uh, where you can do so later on. Um, and just briefly, so also in, in terms of there are other aspects like attitude and motivation and attributions that we know are very critical also to, to maintain and, and promote cognitive health. So when you look at cognitive training performance, so um, uh, in, in older adults um, that I'm illustrating here, so this is a little bit hard to process, it's, it's, it's very crowded, but these illustrates a training trajectory, training performance of about 70 older adult participants who underwent this working memory training. And as you can see, there's really broad variety in how much people are able to improve or benefit from cognitive training. From the person in yellow here who has a really hard time to just move a little beyond the very basic level as compared to this green uh, person here that shows a marked improvement across um, uh, or performance uh, level improvement across the training time. And this is really important because it seems to also, this improvement in training seems to translate also in how much we also improve in these generalized effects in, in these transfer effects. So this is uh, showing data in, in, in children, but we see very similar effects in older adults as well. So when we then translate some, so people who improve as much as this green curve that illustrated here, so people who show a large training gain also are the ones that show the, the, the best improvements in these generalized visual spatial or, or other uh, cognitive domains after training. And on the left, you, you can't even see the, the, the curve because or the, the bar because it's so small. People who don't really improve in the training task itself, they also don't really show any improvements in these um, larger outcome measures. Um, and this is also translated in, in uh, one of our latest paper that we just published here, where we can demonstrate that it's really in, in critical to show this improvement in what we call near transfer. So improvements in, in tasks that are very similar to uh, what, what is being trained. So this is really almost like the gateway to showing these generalized effects uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, to improve in, in, in matrix reasoning. So in, in other words, improvement in the training task itself is really essential in order to see some of these broad benefits. So clearly there are some people who struggle with, with improving in the training task. And there are lots of reasons uh, behind that that we only now start to, to begin to, to uncover. And one aspect is how engaged people are, how motivated people are, how much effort they put in there. And, um, for some people, these tasks are really very effortful and, and maybe not super interesting and they disengage and don't really um, get improvements in the training task itself. And therefore they're not able to, to reap the benefits uh, uh, of the, the training. So the question is how can we design the training task to make it more applicable for our various populations? And also how can we directly target motivation and engagement uh, for people to really um, maximize the benefits of the training. And that is also something that we're currently working on. And um, another thing, another way to potentially boost the, the effects of working memory training is uh, something that we do in my lab, which is called transcranial direct current stimulation or TDCS, which is a non-invasive brain stimulation technique that, that seems to modulate cortical excitability. So uh, what it does, what, what we do is we apply very mild electrical current um, at the surface of the, the scalp. So it's really very mild. It's like you would put a nine volt battery to your head. So it, it's a very mild uh, current um, that you put on your um, on the outside of the skin through electrodes. And what it does, it doesn't really have any um, elicit any um, firing of the neurons, but it, it uh, temporarily lowers or um, the threshold or the potential for for firing. Uh, so it makes it more less or more likely to to fire, which then provides what we would call a little bit of a plus, uh, a window of plasticity. So when we pair this window of plasticity together with a learning event, uh, event, it's possible that this then helps you to learn more during a cognitive training. So the question that we ask here is whether we can boost the effects of training by administering TDCS during this little uh, period of extra plasticity. 
And we have been running quite a, a few um, studies with very promising effects. I'm showing you one here in which we have older adults uh, learn words. So you can imagine you're, you're, you're asked to memorize a shopping list or, or add, um, learn new vocabulary words for a, a foreign language that you're learning. And um, what we have people do, they learn um, new vocabulary words every, every session. Um, and then they have to recall them. And then after at the next session, we ask them to recall all new words that they learned and also the words from the previous session. So each session they learn, know, uh, learn new words. There's more and more words every day. And what we see here is that with TDCS, which is the bleak blue curve here, the people who, who receive TDCS concurrently to learning, they benefit much more. They, they retain more and more words, especially over time. Um, as they, they go through the training, and especially at the follow-up three months after training completion, they also remember more words. They retain uh, almost or, or more than twice as many words um, as opposed to those who just undergo the, the learning of words. So here to keep in mind, people are still learning words. They're just not getting TDCS. So it really seems to be helping or, or boosting the effects of, of training. Um, and that leads me to... Um, the last part here too. So what about um, any long-term effects? So how long do these benefits last? So here I'm showing you, they last up to three months later. We also see some, some remaining benefits up to one year later. So what about even longer? So the most famous study um, is uh, the active study, which was done um, out of, um, um, also supported by the NIH. So Florida State and there uh, many different people were involved. George Reebok here is the author, and they have just completed the 20 year follow up right now, which I can't tell you very much about it, but the 10 year uh, effect um, later on shows that their market remaining benefits of three variants of uh, cognitive training so that focus more on uh, processing speed, reasoning or in memory and on the lowest uh, end is that the control group. So each group that trained for um, about two, three uh, weeks on this cognitive training show remaining benefits that were visible up to 10 years later. Um, and the question is how we get these uh, long-term -ter benefits. And again, there's also large individual differences in how much people are able to retain that we're trying to begin to understand. So the key takeaways that I want you to, to kind of uh, get with you is an engaged lifestyle is really critical to maintain brain plasticity and learning across our lifespan. And it is associated with healthy aging or successful aging. And targeted cognitive training, for example, focusing on working memory, executive function that I was showing you before, is one of the avenues that has shown to be beneficial. But then at the same time, there are several avenues to, to improve brain health. There's clearly no one size fits all, as I was showing you before with these large individual differences. So this is really something that we're only now trying or uh, beginning to understand. And there might be certain um, uh, cognitive interventions or certain other types of interventions that might be more beneficial for certain type of individuals versus learning a new language could be potentially uh, import, uh, or beneficial for other types of uh, individuals, physical exercise or playing a musical instrument. So it's really critical as you uh, think about your cognitively engaged lifestyle to find activities that challenge you intellectually. I think this is really the critical point, but at the same time, you also want to like to engage in, in this uh, um, activity. So we want to, you, you have to find something that you can be passionate about, uh, which then results not only in promoting cognitive health and cognition, but it will also contribute to well-being and overall quality of, of life. And uh, last but not least, so you can help us to really get a better understanding on, on how and, and how these interventions have to be designed in order to reap or in order to, to really maximize our benefits. And here's a quick plug from my end. So we're currently running a big citizen science project in which we're trying to engage 30,000 volunteers who do variants of cognitive training online um, to, to help us understand what type of interventions might be most beneficial for whom and why. Uh, and you can sign up here by scanning the QR code or, or writing down the, the tiny URL here that we have 
or if you're more interested in, in, in um, more targeted interventions for older adults, we have a series of different interventions that focus on the benefits of music and art intervention uh, in order to uh, improve cognitive function and hearing related skills. And, and you can also shoot us a me email or also scan the QR code here. And with that, I would like to acknowledge the many uh, collaborators that, that help us uh, get our, our work done and the funders. And I'm open for Q&A uh, and I'm happy to take any questions at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that presentation. It's very enlightening. I was wondering in, if in any of your studies, you examined the relationship between working memory and sleep in terms of quality versus amount. Because yes. I know as we age, our sleep quality also declines. Yes, precisely. Our sleep declines, sadly. And uh, we do see quite a substantial relationship between uh, sleep quality more so than sleep quantity. So that the subjective quality, so how well I think I've slept and how restorative uh, I think my sleep is, that has effects on, on working memory. So if I just uh, assess people's working memory, people who have a, a poorer quality of sleep, they, they typically don't perform as well as those who report high quality of sleep. But not only that, it also seems to affect training outcomes. So in terms of when I look at the training curves, people with poor sleep quality, they show have a harder time with learning. It's not that they don't learn, but it's just something that seems to affect learning as well. But the good news is there's also a reverse. Um, it goes both ways. So um, there are some studies, not from my lab, but some studies have suggested that, that being engaged in, in working memory training also has positive effects on sleep. So there oh. seems to be a very interesting, intricate uh, relationship between um, working memory and sleep that, that really goes in both directions. And then would you be familiar with like, if it affects a certain part of the sleep cycle, like the deep stages of sleep, the REM sleep or anything like that it can um, correlate with? You know, yeah, people have I, their Fitbit and they're like monitoring their sleep. And my husband will be like, oh, I didn't get enough sleep, deep sleep last night. Right. And so, you know, I was just wondering if there's any correlations between the different phases of sleep or how many, you know, yeah. times you go through. Yeah, no, there's definitely a relationship. And Sarah Metnick, which would be a person that can also invite to, to talk. She is really the expert on campus on sleep and um also, the, the, she has a new book on, on, on the down state and the importance. So deep sleep is really the stage that seems to be um, correlated with uh, uh, long-term memory, but also with a working memory effect. So, so getting enough deep sleep it, it is something that, that's helpful for memory functions. Thank you. And then in terms of like when you did the direct um, stimulation, was there particular areas of the brain that you were trying to hit? Right, yes. Yeah. So what we hit, what we typically try to hit is the prefrontal uh, cortex, so the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. It doesn't seem to be mattering too much, at, at least with the types of uh, training tasks that we use, whether it's left uh, or right, because um, it has to do with kind of the types of processes that are involved when doing our types of working memory training, but we're really trying to hit the, the prefrontal cortices. And that has also connections to then hippocampal areas and, and other as well. So it's not just that this particular area is affected, but the entire networks um, of, of brain functions. I think I need to do that for my son. He's seven years old and so that I could try to get him to learn and remember things better. <laughs> Would it work if you're just studying or is it like specifically like when you're doing certain tasks? I mean, yeah, so typically it has to be, yeah, typically it has your to working be paired memory versus with, yes, it has to be learning. paired with a, with a active learning um, activity. So otherwise it has not shown to be super um, helpful. So you really need to, um, to be engaged in a task to, to, to kind of be, be helpful at the same time. So there's very little that is known in, in children in how and, and whether and how that, that might be the most um uh, promising avenue to go. Great, thank you. I think we have a question. What are the apps that you recommend for use? <laughs> yeah, that's always a good question. So first of all, I recommend you, you, you sign up to our citizen science project. So this uh, on, on the left here, that QR code, 
then you can actually so it's an app that you can download um uh on uh, from uh, ios but also for android where you can actually try the apps and the assessments yourself and and then i would argue this is probably one of the best studies um examples for brain training and the the, the best controls uh, in general, I would not like to, to really endorse certain pro uh, products because there's so many out there and it's really difficult to keep track on, on, on the various apps. In, in general, uh, my recommendation is not to pay any money or very little money for these apps because there's so many free apps out there that are probably as good or bad as, as any other types of apps uh, that are there. But typically, if you think about when you're doing these apps or trying these, these cognitive training paths, if you can do them sort of mindlessly without being uh, engaged, um, that, that it, or you can hold a conversation at the same time, then it's probably not, not the most helpful <laughs> app because it doesn't really target these working memory and executive processes in a way that you want. So it has to be effortful in, in, in some way. If you I like to make the analogy, if you want to, to become physically fit, um, if you go on a treadmill and just leisurely walk very slowly and not really engage, so you will not expect to, to really improve your, your physical fitness that much. So you really have to put in some work and, and um, engage and, and run to some extent in order to improve. And that's the same um, uh, with these types of cognitive apps as well. What what length of time would you like recommend just for you know general retired older adults who want to keep up their working memory? Yeah, like so twenty it, minutes a day, five yeah. minutes a day. Yeah, that that's that's a good question. So in our studies, we typically ask people to train for about fifteen to twenty minutes a day. Sometimes it's up to half an hour, but this is kind of the 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 time that that seems to be helpful at some point it's also not fun anymore so you can also do other things you can go outside for a walk or run or, or do something else uh, but but yeah we typically ask um, people to do about 15 to 20 minutes with kids we do even shorter so we do like five minute um, blocks and you mentioned your son who has a hard time focusing so five minutes and then have a little break and do another five minutes so it depends a little bit on the on the age and then the other, the next question was, what is the commitment level for the study? Yes, so we have various studies um, that you can engage in. So with uh, with the big citizen science project, um, it is about um, a month of commitment. So these 15, 20 minutes a day that I was mentioning, um, when you sign up, you see all the details at the beginning where you can see the description and, and, and um, how long it takes. Um, so you can think about it um, every day for the next month or so. You spend uh, 20 minutes a day in, in um, doing assessment and, and, and training. And then hopefully uh, you will be able to see some improvements in your cognitive functions um, afterwards. Hmm. Well, great. Thank you so much for this very useful information. Um, and, you know, we look forward to hearing more about the results of your different studies. All right. Well, you're very welcome. And um, again, if people have questions, so reach out to us. Um, we have some um, uh, information and then I, I think um, there will be some slides or other informations will be sent out, which also has some contact information if people have more questions and um, want to know more. Yes. Yeah, so, and then the last question was, what age groups do you need for your study? Yeah. Um, so either 18 and above. So anyone above 18. Uh, and then for the, the, the studies that are more focused on, on older adults specifically, it's 55 and up. But we have various studies, so people can just reach out to us as well. And then we can give them information of the, about the various studies and find the one that might be the one that they might be most interested in. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining our Integrative Insider Live community lecture. At the end of the webinar, a pop-up window will have a valuable survey on this evening's event. So if you can please answer that survey, it would help us to improve our community offerings. We will also be emailing um, Dr. Yaki's presentation deck and resources and key takeaways to the email address provided at registration. 
We will be taking a break in July and return at the end of August, launching our new Samueli Institute Research Webinar Series. And our next Integrative Insider Live will be scheduled in September. More information will be sent through our monthly emails and registration and posted at our website, ssihi.uci.edu. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.